All right, welcome back to uh, Machine Organization and Programming. We're going a little bit into operating systems today, and we've got the second topic up, uh, memory virtualization. All right, here's the idea. Um, we have different models uh, we've used throughout history for the address space. Um, looking over here on the left, we've got a really old school version where I've got the entire physical memory, however much I have. Back in the day, it wasn't very much. I'm going to load the operating system into the very top, maybe 512 kilobytes, something like that. I want to keep that very small because I don't have very much memory back in the 70s or 80s. Then I'm going to load the entire process, all the memory, and I'm just going to give the entire process all the memory, um, all the remaining memory. I'll keep the operating system up here, process down below that, and the process will know that there's some reserved memory up at the top. And then um, when the process finishes, operating system will load the entire next process all right uh, this doesn't allow for any context switching no time sharing we're running one program at a time and I'm pretty sure my very first computer actually worked like this all right so we can do better the second version here that I have a little bit more advanced is still gonna load the entire operating system right there into physical memory then uh, we'll load the process in this one will allow for process switching or time sharing. What we're going to do is every time we switch, we'll save everything to the disk and then we'll load in process one. Um, if you don't have very much memory, it doesn't take that long to do this, but still saving something to the hard drive, very slow. Um, but it still does allow for time sharing. So multiple people can run their process at the same time on the computer, or you can run multiple programs at the same time. But generally we want to avoid that save to the hard drive. All right, another version, um, the one used in modern computers, is to divide up the memory somehow for each process. And I've got two different models I'll talk about in a second. We'll still put the operating system somewhere in physical memory. Uh, then we'll have process one somewhere in physical memory, process zero somewhere in physical memory, and so on. Um, all right, so here's the idea. Uh, we've been writing programs all semester long, and we've basically been able to make the assumption that whatever program I'm writing, this is my work, I get the entire address space. You know, address zero is reserved. I've got my code up here at the top. I've got my data section for all of the like string literals and global variables that have been initialized, my heap. Then way down at the bottom, I've got the stack. I get all the addresses. On a 32-bit machine, that's 2 to the 32 memory addresses that I can write to. All right, but I don't have that much physical memory in my computer. And in fact, what we're gonna do is find out that the operating system and the computer hardware work together to map this entire virtual address space, all 32 to the 32nd addresses, to locations in memory on the hard drive. No, I'm sorry, locations in RAM. And if there's not enough, some of them may go to the hard drive. All right. Um, and each of the processes just gets mapped to a different region in physical memory. All right, the goals, uh, we want to hide all the details. We want all of our programs to think they have all two to the 32 addresses available to them. We want to be able to do that translation to go from the programmer address, the virtual addresses, to the real physical addresses on RAM. Need that to be fast. Uh, we also want to be able to protect the memory used by one process from all the rest of the processes. You know, I don't want to be able to read the memory from some other user who happens to be using the same machine at the same time I am. All right, and then um, some of the other goals, um, the we'll find the operating system takes care of deciding what happens when I don't have enough memory and some program we needs more memory. I mean, we're gonna write something to the hard drive and load it back in later when we need it again, but the operating system will take care of the where do we allocate memory for different programs. Um, we won't go into this in this class. Uh, this is my advertisement for you guys to go take operating systems next semester. Um, I believe this is a prerequisite for that, and that's the general path that most people take. All right, uh, end advertisement. Okay, we also want it to be as easy as possible to program, and that goes right along with hiding all the details. All right, so the idea here um, is address-based virtualization. So, for example, uh, if I have a process and somewhere in my assembly, I've got an instruction that says, move some memory address. So I need to go to memory to get this and shove it in EAX. This probably would have been a better example because my arrows go the other way. But here's the idea. Um, 
there's some hardware in there, the memory management union unit, that's going to take this physical or virtual address and translate it and just figure out how it maps to some address in the process uh, in the physical memory. So this address right here that I see as a programmer is almost certainly not the same address where it's really stored. And there's just, you know, some you can imagine this is just a table that it looks up this address maps to this one. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. We'll talk about that in the next few slides. Um, and then the operating system is working along with this to keep track of, you know, which memory is being used. Yeah, here's some for process one, here's some for zero, and which is free. Here's a block that's free in between here. All right, I've got two different models for how this mapping can happen. The first one is known as segmentation. And essentially what this is going to do, it looks just like the picture. I'm going to give every process a chunk of memory. So here process one has that memory. I'm going to keep track of the starting address where process one begins and the ending address where process one, you know, ends. Um, sometimes this is done as an offset from the base. Sometimes it's just given the exact address where it ends. Um, in order for this model to work, the address space in physical memory that I'm using needs to be a, a, like a contiguous block, all of it at once. I'm not going to split up the memory for process one into more than one place. I've only got one base, one bound register, so everything for process one goes all in one chunk in a row. Um, that makes figuring out where the physical address is very simple. I take my process address and I just add the base to it. It also means that I, I'm going to attempt to use very small addresses. So I, where I put the stack, um, you know, before I would have said it's at the very bottom of the space. It is at the, like, the lowest down thing, but I'm going to actually move it up and keep it relatively close so that I have a very small uh, uh, difference between the base and the bound or how much space I'm using. Um, and if I need more space, I will go ahead and reserve that ahead of time by changing the size of the stack. All right, um, so physical address is just the virtual address over here plus the base, and that's going to go get me wherever this is in memory. All right, one of the cool things about this is because it, the physical memory is all managed by the operating system is that it's relocatable. Um, so it's not something we can do as a programmer, but suppose I have a request for more memory for process one. I'm going to expand this address space. And, you know, I want to make the heap bigger or something like that. So one of the things I can do here is I've only reserved uh, this much between the base and the bound. And there isn't more space. Process zero is in memory right next to that. So I've got a couple of options. I could take everything from this process and just copy it down somewhere else. Maybe down here at the bottom there's enough space. Maybe I'll make that box a little bigger um, next time so it looks like there's enough space. Uh, and then all I need to do after I copy it to a different space in physical RAM is change my base and bound. And all of a sudden, I've completely um, relocated it, and I have uh, more space available for process one. All right, the downside to this segmentation model, uh, well, that's slow, obviously, to move things relatively, but it leads to external fragmentation. So this is a unusable space between blocks um, that I need to go back and move things around to get rid of. So this space right here might not be enough room to expand process one. And so this is wasted space, an external fragment that is unusable until I move things around. I can, you know, move process two up, get rid of that. Then there's definitely going to be enough room for process one down below. All right, that's all there is to segmentation. All right, so the next idea is known as paging. So here's the idea here. What I'm going to do is break all of my physical memory and my virtual memory into uh, identical size pages, just like pages on a book. I've got a certain number of characters I can type onto a page. Uh, in my example, I'm going to use four kilobyte pages. It's pretty typical um, size for a 32-bit machine. I've got my entire virtual memory address space up here. So all the way from address zero to address 2 to the 32nd at the bottom. I've got my code laid out, my data heap stacked, just like all semester long. And each of these pages, you know, this is 4 kilobytes worth of code right here, I'm going to keep track of, in a page table, where this maps to in physical memory. 
this block of code isn't necessarily right next to this one. It could be any of these available pages in physical memory. So maybe that one. Um, this code, you know, maybe way down here. So that's all there is to it. This page table is each of these entries is just four bytes. All it needs to do is keep track of where it maps to. Uh, just the starting address of a physical page. All right. Um, also note that each process gets its... Oh, I've got a typo. Time out. Okay, got that fixed. All right. What I want to point out here is that each process gets its own page table. So here's um, program one or process one. Here's the page table for process one. It shows all of the mappings. There is one entry for every single possible page. All right, um, I got some math on the next slide. We'll talk about that in a second. But for process two, I've got code data heap in my stack. These are mapping to different physical pages, physical memory, but I still have all possible pages, address zero to address two to the 32nd. My page table here still has one entry, four bytes, for every single page over here. All right, and they map to different spots in physical memory. Um, the operating system takes care of all the complicated details like what if I run out of memory, what if I need to exchange something, um, and I'm not going to go into that here. The reading does a little bit, but you know, just a, a, a high level overview. All right, uh, real quick, I want to do a little bit of math here. Uh, please remember the memory is divided into fixed size blocks, we're calling them pages. Um, pretty typical size for a 32-bit machine is uh, four kilobytes or 4096 bytes that's 2 to the 12th which means that I can use the last 12 bytes uh, bits 12 bits of an address to represent the offset into memory so for example if I have address one two three four five six seven eight uh, each hex digit represents four bytes so I will need three bytes I'm gonna use the last 12 bits to indicate how far from the starting address of a page my address is. Okay? So if I'm looking at, you know, address 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 is right here in this block of code. All right, that means that the it will be um, address uh, 6, 7, 8 away from the start of the block of code. And if this maps to, let's see here, this physical memory address down here, I'm going to find this uh, at address what, 678 away from the start of this. Okay, and that means that I can use the other five hex digits or 20 bits to indicate which page I'm looking at. So that means that this page table has two to the 20th entries. All right, that's a lot, two to the 20th. All right, uh, so I'm going to divide the address into two parts, my page index and the offset into my four kilobyte page zone. All right. And remember, each process gets its own page table. This is a huge table and every process gets one. All right. So the page table entries, this is only four bytes. This is four kilobytes. These are four kilobytes, but this is only four bytes, but still it's got two to the 20th entries. So two to the 20th, well, let me think here, two to the 10th is one kilobyte. Two to the 20th is about one megabyte. They're four bytes each. That means that the entire page table for a 32-bit machine is going to be 4 megabytes. And every process gets its own. So that means if I have 100 processes, this page table is going to be 400 megabytes. And the operating system is going to keep track of that on its stack. All right, there's a, a number of ways we can minimize that or reduce it and make it more efficient to look things up. Yeah, I'm not going to go into that. This is the end of the lecture. This is all I wanted to do for this virtual memory is introduce the idea of paging, indicate that there's there's a challenge here that we need to think about. Uh, yet again, an advertisement, go take operating systems. All right, uh, have a good day. I'll be right back with the last video.